Before we get into today's chat, I want to share a little resource that we've just released. As you might know, in our checkout episodes, I ask our e-commerce guests, do you have a book or a podcast that you recommend our listeners get into? Well, I've taken all of those book recommendations, and there's over a hundred of them, plus the stories that go behind them, and put them into their own book called The Book Recommendations of E-Commerce Experts. Yeah, I know, it's totally original. You will never, ever run out of reading ideas again. You can download that one now for free over on addtocart.com.au. Welcome to The Checkout. We catch up with previous Add to Cart guests and ask them five quick questions to get to know them better and leave you with a little extra inspiration to get through your Friday. Here's your host, Bushy. Today's Checkout features Daniel Kate, founder of Fun Day Natural Sweets. They're a confectionery brand making lollies with no sugar or sugar alcohol added. Daniel's own weight loss journey left him missing out on the joy of one of his favorite treats and inspired him to create a replacement. Fun Day's unique formula maximizes taste and eliminates the frequent trips to the loo that many healthier lollies can bring. They have a five-star rating, contain around 100 calories per pack, and can be found in Chemist Warehouse and Woolies. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us on The Checkout. We had an awesome chat before around how you've established Fun Day as the alternative healthy sweet or lolly and some of the distribution that you've got into Chemist Warehouse and other big retailers as well as Amazon and the subscription that you set up so much in there. But today, we are here to learn a little bit about you. Five quick questions. Number one, what is the weirdest thing that you've ever bought online? This is a tough one. I think the weirdest thing is something, an ingredient that I found on Alibaba from China. It's called a sterile, like a plant sterile. And I was Googling it because I had this idea that I could put steroles in, you know, those like instant hot chocolate sachets. Yeah. And you could have that because the benefit about a sterile is it lowers your cholesterol. And I did all this stuff. I bought, I had to buy 10 kilos of this random white powder from China. And then I tried it with hot chocolate. And that was inspected in customs. Yeah, uh, totally. And then they, I tried this thing. It was excellent. And then I spoke to a Rex consultant. She said, no, you can't do it. It's illegal or something like that. So that was that was that was done in about a week. But I reckon ten kilos of this sterile powder, which I ended up having to chuck out, is the weirdest thing I've ever bought. <laughs> that is good. All right, number two. Who is your favourite retailer? I got two. I l- absolutely love Kmart and I love JB Hi-Fi. There's something about those retailers where you walk in and it feels weird not to buy something. Their merchandising is just fantastic. And the quality of their products is now good. Say for Kmart's perspective, it's changed a lot. Yep. And there's something to be said for just being quite mass market, but just absolutely doing a cracker job at it. I'd probably say Chemist Warehouse falls into that category as well. You just walk in there, you have to buy something. You have to, right? That mentality, that psychology, the way they position things, I think is just genius. And I'll never understand it, but it's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, when you when you actually put it on paper or take a photograph of it, you go, it doesn't make sense, but it's when you're in there, you know that you're going to spend. It's a great point. Yep. Yep. Number three, which e-commerce practice do you wish was history? I mean, the only like practical thing I could probably say was just spending advertising dollars on like Meta or some of those platforms. Like it's just not what it stacks up to be, it's way more difficult. I wish there was a better way to interact with people through socials and educate them without spending all this money with what typically wasted ad spend. Like that's, I wish that was done. Mm. But what I loved about our chat in the main episode was that you gave so many examples of alternative marketing that you've used, whether that be partnership marketing, the influencer stuff, even things like the TikTok examples that we gave. There was so much that you're doing that falls outside of that traditional yep. go spend 100 bucks on Meta and hope that it brings in $400. Yeah, I think our job, as a, my job as a business owner, is to ensure that we have sustained sales coming through the door. And if you put all your eggs into one basket through Meta and you have really poor ROAS CPAs for that month, then you're finished. Like that's all the marketing dollars you've got. It's whether it's the online, how we d- divide up the marketing dollars, 
and even how we divide retail, whether it's through grocery, pharmacy, petrol and convenience, health food, independence, online. It's all part of a deliberate strategy to diversify risk because if we lose one, then the business still continues. And it's the same thing for marketing dollars. If Meta stinks one month, then we're fine. We've still got a bunch of other things rolling in the background. Very, very smart. Number four, can you recommend a book or a podcast that our listeners should immediately get into? From a, like a CPG perspective, there's a book that I read many years ago, probably seven, eight years ago, called Delivering Happiness. It's the story of the Zappos, I guess, how it came to life. The reason I like that book is it frames their brand and their product offering in a very unique way. So typically you get into business and you'd say, like, I'm going to create a business selling tables and we sell tables, right? And that's what we do. We make the best tables. But the way that this book makes you think about it is like, well, no, you don't. You actually are offering family dinners and families to connect and comfort and memories to be shared. So they go like a level deeper than what you're physically selling. And for us at Fun Day, it's like, yes, I could say we're a lolly business and we just sell, you know, confectionery. But what do we actually do? We actually take, to give that person or the customer a couple of minutes out of their really crazy day and give them a really great experience and a great fun moment to just relax and enjoy and do their thing. And part of the learnings from this book are like, well, it's not just the product, it's everything. It's what's the customer experience, what are the touch points along the journey to make sure that that customer is having an excellent experience. For the first year of the business, our e-com customers just got a plain cardboard box to their door. And when we started, looked at it and said, well, what are we trying to do? We're trying to create this fun moment. But the first thing they see is a boring brown cardboard box. It didn't take too long to say, all right, let's redesign our box. Let's redesign the experience, what communication we provide them during and after the eating process of the confectionery. And how do we communicate with them to make sure that we're delivering on this message, which is bigger than just lollies. Love it. And I couldn't agree with your recommendation anymore. It's actually the book that first got me passionate about e-commerce and mm. I have it on my bookshelf above me. Yep. And it is the first book that we give our students when we are teaching the e-commerce accelerator There you go. because it's all about sell what the solution and the benefit is, yep. Yep. look after your customers, yep. all the great principles yep. that you described there. Yep. Last question I have for you, finish this sentence, the future of retail is? Oh, it's a really tough question, but I would say omnichannel. I think, you know, having experienced businesses in the past purely online and also purely offline, I think both carry very significant pros and cons. I think most brands getting into retail need to consider what an omnichannel approach looks like and it's purely to diversify risk. You could, you know, take, for example, COVID, where no one was going into stores for a long, long time or, you know, doing online checkouts and things like that, deliveries. If you didn't have an online business, you're sort of screwed. Hmm. Contrary, if your website goes down and there's an issue with your tech stack, well, at least you can go into store and buy the product. So I think for sustainable, the business sustainability purposes, having your products available in as many channels that make sense for your brand as possible is the best thing you could possibly do for your brand. Yeah. Really well put. It gives you options as a business, but it also gives your customers options in terms of how they want to experience it. Absolutely. And everyone's different. Some people love buying online. Some people like sitting in the store and doing their thing. And, you know, the job as a brand is to, like, you've got customers that need things and their needs change and you need to keep adapting to that. It's easy to create a website these days. It's very hard to get your product into the offline environment and ultimately, you have to consider all those things we discussed about, you know, packaging, branding. The product actually has to be excellent. It's got to pass the hurdles and the thresholds. And I think having that approach of Omnichannel will make brands do a better job as well. So well put. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us on The Checkout. Thanks for having me, Nathan. To hear more from Daniel, jump back into episode 317, where Daniel shares how a unique influencer box helped Funday achieve liftoff the journey to having a profitable Amazon presence, and how a brand crush set the tone for his mission to make lollies cool. Thanks for listening, and until next time, keep adding to cart.